Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 35 of What to Think, the technology news podcast from VentureBeat.com. I'm Dylan Tweeney, the editor-in-chief of VentureBeat. I'm here with Dean Takahashi, one of our senior gaming and uh, gadget writers. Welcome, Dean. Hello. Today, we're going to be talking to Gary Shapiro. He is the CEO of CEA. That's short for the Consumer Electronics Association. And it is a big industry association of gadget and appliance and and electronics makers. They put on the CES, which is an annual giant annual electronics show in Las Vegas, which Dean will be flying out to cover uh, in just a couple days. But before we get to that, um, let's cover some tech news highlights. In this podcast, we usually pick three of the best or most popular stories from the previous week. But since this is the last podcast of the year, and we're staring down the face of New Year's Eve, I've decided to pick three of the most popular stories for all of 2014. Let's start with this one, which I thought was kind of interesting about Isohunt unofficially resurrecting the Pirate Bay. This actually came out just a couple weeks ago in the middle of December. So the Pirate Bay is this, you know, famous site for finding torrents. So you can uh, download, you know, mostly illegally copyrighted music and movies and stuff. And the Pirate Bay was kind of like a search engine for BitTorrent. It actually went down recently, closed down. The founder said they uh, would have released the code open source, but it was in too much of a mess to do it. And it was just time for it to be done. But there are all kinds of Pirate Bay clones that seem to be popping up now. All of them seemingly totally unofficial. Oldpiratebay.org, isohunt.to, and other things. So, Dean, are you a big Pirate Bay user? I am not a big Pirate Bay user, <laughs> but uh, I, ha- I cannot vouch for other members of my family. <laughs> and if you were, you wouldn't be admitting it on a national podcast, I'm sure. That's right. I, you know, I'm just astounded at how popular this story was. And it, it sort of just tells me how interested people are in this this subject. And uh and probably how large an underground economy there is. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I mean, I don't know how economy enters into it per se. I mean, pe- people for the most part aren't paying for things they download, right? You know, there's such a potent desire for for downloadable, um, you know, illicit, you know, whether those are the latest unreleased Sony movies or whether those are, you know, old Bob Dylan concert bootlegs or what have you. I mean, people really, really want this stuff. It, it's kind of hard to deny that that's had to have had some impact on the... Uh, content business, on the music and and movie businesses. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to another story. This is one of our top stories. We published it in April, and the headline is, Why Google Doesn't Care About College Degrees, in five quotes. Google's chairman and head of hiring, a man named Laszlo Bach, spoke to the New York Times and uh, gave them a few insights about how he sorts through all the millions of applicants they must have to find find the right ones. Venture B contributor Greg Ferenstein uh, summarized some of this and picked out the juiciest quotes. For instance, as Bach said, you don't necessarily need to go to college. And if you do, you need to put some thought into, into why you're going and what you want to get out of it. Too many people apparently just go to college to get, a, you know, get their card punched. And I, it sounds like Google is not particularly interested in hiring that kind of person. Dean, you've got a daughter who just started college this year. Mm-hmm. I had a friend who worked at Google, and she felt like uh, she was the oldest person there, that every, everybody else was half her age. <laughs> and so I, th- I think what Google wants here is that they've, they've run out of college students to hire, and they want to go on to high school students. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, to me, that's the only explanation for why they wouldn't want uh, college graduates, right? I mean, they, they just want to lower the age, age uh, bracket even, even more. That's right. All you people out there who are high school students with just crazy programming skills, and if you can prove that you've got some persistence and some grit and, and some talent, uh, go for it. And let us know if you land a job at Google. We'd like to hear about it. I'm going to talk about the iPhone 6 next. iPhone stories obviously are always very popular in all the tech press, and this year was no exception as uh, Apple released the iPhone 6 and the 6 Plus. Before it came out, though, in June... Our writer, Mark Sullivan, had a source tell him that the iPhone 6 will feature NFC, which is near-field communications, wireless charging, a better 4G antenna, and a much bigger screen. He was wrong about the wireless charging. Our source got that wrong. But we were actually the first publication, as far as I know of, to report the addition of NFC, 
which uh, people initially kind of laughed about. They were like, no way, Apple is not going to add NFC. I mean, it's turned out to be uh, right on the money about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, NFC is very sort of critical for, for things like Apple Pay. If you want to use your phone to, to pay for something, um, you want to establish that uh, connection very quickly and easily and just tap something and, and buy it. That's exactly right. And it was a feature that was previously on Android phones. And I think perhaps Apple had made some comments a couple of years ago suggesting that they would, wouldn't even touch it, probably because at the time it wasn't fully baked enough to be really super easy to use. And Apple t- has a tendency to take, you know, the sort of wait and see attitude towards new technologies like that. They wait until they're fully cooked. And then they put them in their phones. For sure, they probably wanted something much more secure than what was originally out there. Yes, and if you combine NFC with Touch ID, which lets you identify yourself using uh, your thumbprint and the circuitry in the iPhone that keeps that kind of data completely encrypted, even at the chip level, that promises a much higher level of security than you could get through credit cards. I guess the, the one little feature that wasn't accurate, I guess, was that this iPhone 6 would have wireless charging. Uh, that was part of the rumor uh, back when this uh, story surfaced. And uh, I, I guess the only explanation might be that um, they, they just try to cram everything they can into these phones. And uh, maybe at some point in the ship or don't ship time frame, they decide it's, it's just not quite ready for, for prime time. Eventually something has to give. Wireless charging is kind of where NFC was a couple of years ago. You know, you've got some early adopters who are really into it. They really like it. But for the most part, it's either, you know, you're setting your phone down on a mat, which is sort of slightly more convenient than plugging it in. I'm starting to see these little uh, wireless charging uh, circles at uh, uh, tables on, at, at Starbucks now. So they're, they're giving it a try out here. They have them at Starbucks. All right. Well, I'll look for that. I have not seen that yet. All right. We're going to move on to our guest, Gary Shapiro, in just a minute. But first, I want to take a moment to thank the host and sponsor of this podcast, New Relic. It's a software analytics company that makes sense of billions of data points about millions of applications in real time. New Relic helps the people who build modern software understand the stories their data is trying to tell them about app performance and their entire business. And just a note of congratulations to New Relic, which uh, went public earlier this month uh, and is now traded on the stock market. Now let's go to our guest, Gary Shapiro. He is the CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. He's also the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Ninja Innovation and The Comeback, How Innovation Will Restore the American Dream. And uh, he's probably got his hands really full right now because in about a week, CES starts. That's the big consumer tech show that is in Las Vegas every year. How huge is that going to be this year, Gary? Well, it will certainly have our biggest footprint with the most exhibitors ever. It's uh, huge. Don't you say that every year? Like the biggest ever? Does it just keep growing? No, you know, actually it it went down pretty dramatically in 2009 and it went down in 2002 and maybe three big recessions, big events. And it, it, it went down significantly, but it seems to ratchet upwards and we're using every square inch of space we could find for the most part, but we're approaching 2.2 million net square feet of exhibit space. We have over about 3,500 exhibitors or so, and we have, well, we don't know how many people are coming, but a lot of people say they're coming. Let me put it that way. 5,000 press like me, right? (laughs) 5,000 press, over 40,000 people from outside the United States, lots of buyers and investors and manufacturers and inventors. We have one portion of the show called Eureka Park, which is just for startups. You've done that for a couple of years, right? Yeah, we just started a few years ago. We had 220 in 2014. And January CES next week, we'll have 375 companies. And we that's what the show is about. It's anyone with an idea can expose it to literally tens of thousands of important people like yourself and investors and partners and retailers. And we have a lot of scientists with ideas there. It's just a very exciting. We have universities there, and we have even have a huge delegation from France there. A lot of politicians, as usual, as well, right? Yeah, we have over 100 people coming from the Washington, D.C., including ambassadors, FCC, FTC commissioners, congressmen, 
a lot of uh, legislative staff, regulators, uh, people like that, and from around the world. We even have a couple of French ministers that say they're coming because they want to see how we do it. And we have a whole bunch of new marketplaces that are coming on that we never had before on cybersecurity, personal privacy, smart home. What a huge category that is. Sports technology like soccer balls and basketballs and golf clubs that tell you what they're doing and how you swing or throw. Streaming content and my favorite, unmanned systems, which I call drones. You know, little things that go anywhere you want with cool cameras attached. Everybody's talking about drones. I want to go back to Eureka Park and this startup idea because when I was last at CES, which wasn't last year, it was a couple of years ago, I thought Eureka Park was one of the most interesting things about it because you, you typically go to CES and you see these giant companies like you know Panasonic and Sony with uh, booths that seem to go on forever and they're showing TVs and things like that. You can get a little jaded about that, or at least somebody like me can get a little jaded. Tell me what, you know, what motivated the startup, inviting the startups into the mix. Honestly, I first got involved with this organization over 30 years ago. The philosophy was always we have to run the event so anyone with an idea can expose it to people like you and investors and partners and retailers from around the world. And we still have that philosophy. This is just the next logical step is that we took a portion of the show. We uh, make it so it's, it's about $1,000 a company, which people can put on their credit card. And we give them everything. You just have to show up, you get a chair, you get a table, you get electricity, you get things like that. And it has to, you, know, you have to qualify. You have to have something original and unique. You can't have a product in the market yet. You have to be a startup. And it's attracted so much attention and gotten so many great ideas. And companies that are there have been about, a, we figured about $100 million worth of uh, acquisitions have gone on there and investments. And Walmart's gone through there and placed purchase orders. And Mark Cuban's made million-dollar investments. So it's a, uh, it's a happening area of the show. It's consistent with the philosophy of, of the show and, frankly, of the country of innovation and startups. And this is how it progress. And the big companies like it as well because they recognize some of their best ideas will come from startups as well. So it works for everyone. So tell me about innovation. This has been a subject for you um, in, in your books. You've written a lot about the potential for the electronics industry and um, you know for technology entrepreneurs in general and tech companies to kind of kickstart the economy. How do things look from your point of view, Gary? Things look great. I mean, the truth is that our country is in a very good place right now. Obviously, the fall in fuel prices has freed up some disposable income. Compared to many other, if not most other countries in the world, we have a very pro-innovation bias. It doesn't take that long for a company to start here. We have a diverse culture, which encourages innovation. We bemoan the fact that our kids don't do well at standardized tests, but we're among the best in the world when it comes to asking why or why not. You know, most of us descend from immigrant stock, and that means our forefathers came here for a better life. They want to do things better. We're always asking how we can do it better. Although our taxes are pretty high in corporations, they're not the highest in the world for individuals, and that means if you do something and you're a Mark Zuckerberg or a Bill Gates or, you know, thousands of others, actually, you could benefit and make a lot of money. And that encourages not only the founders, but those who, who start out at, at startups. And people want to work at startups. Some of our best and brightest want to work at startups, which is a great thing. So I think all signs are good. Plus, we're in an innovation cycle. I believe we're just at the beginning. It's not only the internet and wireless and broadband. It's the fact that we have sold over a billion cell phones around the world, a lot of them with sensors in them, which tell you all sorts of things. And sensors now are just a few pennies a piece. In fact, we have a portion of the show just focused on sensors. But those sensors are building blocks for a whole range of things, whether it's the Internet of Things, the connected home, all sorts of things that can do things and tell you things and act automatically. And, and clever people take those building blocks, put them together, create algorithms, create a useful service, do it in a way which is easy for a consumer to benefit from and understand, and they've created a business, and it could be a worldwide business. So I think we're in a great place as a nation, we're in a great place as an industry, we're in a great place for innovation, for a lot of good reasons. And, you know, knock wood, things are going well. I mean, look, even Congress agreed on stuff in mid-December. They didn't shut down the country. <laughs> Amazingly uh, enough, they passed yeah, a, I mean, a budget resolution. These things. We celebrate <laughs> these things in Washington, D.C., where I am. <laughs> So right now, I think we're, we're in a great, great place. You know, you know, President Obama is, uh, is at a point in his presidency where I think he wants to get some things done. And I think maybe I'm too optimistic, which I always am at the beginning of the year. 
but that's what the CES is about. It's it's the spring of our industry. It's a good you know, time to be optimistic. Open optimism. <laughs> I've been going for almost a couple of, couple of decades to this show, and um, you know, one one of the things that I always look for is one year I might see something like Oculus and and think, hey, that that could be really cool. I don't. I wonder if it's going to catch on. And then the next year, you know, there's maybe 20 or 30 or, or 40 of those things. Um, is that one of the things that is a benefit of CES? That if, if you if you go to CES often enough, um, you, you sort of get this ability to see something grow like that? Well, absolutely. The CES is a place for products to be introduced. It's where innovation comes to market. But the truth is, with something like Oculus or take another example is Nest, you get a, a company or a product which sells for a phenomenal amount of money, and that gives other investors confidence to put money in it. Now, sometimes, like you could go back a few years and see the tablets. There was 50 companies showing tablets. You know, most of them did not have a successful offerings there. It gets crowded quickly in electronics. Good ideas catch on quickly. People try to jump on, and, and there are winners, and but there are also losers. But that's the marketplace, and that's why people go there in part. You know, as much as I believe in technology and our ability to talk the way we are now using, t you know, the Internet and technology, you have to go to places and deal with people, use your five senses, get a sense of whether you can trust someone, get an idea about the entire marketplace. And also, as we say for those going to see us, there's a huge value to serendipity. You know, sometimes the Internet does not allow that much serendipity. Your, a lot of your choices are determined by maybe prior sites you visited or whatever you type in in your search or what you're looking for. At CES, we always encourage people to walk around the floor a little bit, be surprised, be inspired, get great ideas. And what we've also succeeded in doing CES is, is saying, look, this isn't just about old existing technologies. This is about different industries coming together. The automotive industry is huge. Hollywood is there. The content creators, uh, Madison Avenue the semiconductor world, the hardware world, the broadcast world. We get people from all over the world now that are focused on the concept of innovation. And there's this great convergence going on in, in services of any type. And what we're seeing at, increasingly at CES are problems in the world being solved, whether it's we have products there showing how much water you should be giving you know, crops, you know, send mm. you information on that, or mm. uh, food production. You're seeing increasingly 3D printing, for example, not only about products, but it's starting to shift to food. And we'll see it increasingly there. Wireless health is huge. There's so many uh, solutions that are coming out in healthcare because of technology and sensing devices, which solves a tremendous amount of problems. We're seeing it in the automobile with collision avoidance systems, safety products, and things like that. So a lot of the products which have caused accident and death and misery and things like that before 20, 30 years ago, in the next 10 and 20 years, will be resolved by a lot of the products you see at CES and other trade shows. It sounds like a very different kind of CES than it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago when it was sort of a show, I think, frequented largely by buyers, people representing Best Buy or you know something like that, or Circuit City at the time, right, who were, who were talking to manufacturers about what kind of products they might stock in the coming year. And it was all sort of dominated by TVs and computers and DVD players and the like. It's, it sounds much more diverse now. Absolutely. The definition of consumer electronics we've sought to broaden. That's why we include cars and things like 3D printing and health and sports and sensors and, and uh, wearables and drones. And also, you're right, that who we've sought to attract. I mean, we honestly, there's a chapter of this about this in, in, in my book, Ninja Innovation, and it talks about specifically about our strategy, which was to redefine consumer electronics broadly, to make sure that innovation is the theme, to get everyone around the world who focuses on these at the CEO, CEO, CXO, journalist level, the investors, and get them in one place because we believe the industries were converging. And, you know, at this point, we're right. You know, we never want to sit on our laurels, but we keep expanding. If you talked to me a few years ago, I'd be talking about information, entertainment, and education. Now I'm happy to talk about the world's problems, at least in regard to health care and agriculture and hunger and car accidents and things like that. So we are solving some big problems. We're not solving and we're giving a venue for others to solve them. I want to be, I mean, I, I have never invented anything in my life. So it's just we, <laughs> our job is to provide, get people like you who analyze and report together with people who invent, together with people who invest, with people who buy. But we could get the top buyers in one room. 
The only problem is that you're too successful and that uh, it's it's possible for people and companies to get lost now at CES and uh, it's it's so big. Uh, how does a little startup get noticed? Well, we focus on that issue every day. So we do try to control attendance. We don't want really many more than 160,000 people at this point in Las Vegas. We've come up with a new app so people could get around. We spent a lot of money on buses and and we want people to plan ahead of time and, and stay to the show floor. We discourage companies from outboarding the show. What does outboarding mean? Outboarding is exhibiting outside the official show. Oh. You know, we don't care if companies have meetings or show up or things like that, but you shouldn't have exhibits and pull people off the floor. Mm-hmm. And we're pretty strong on that point. But we also, for startups and others, we give them a lot of promotional support. We tell them how to write a press release, what to do. We give venues. We, you know, if something's really novel, um, we have 750 speakers. We want people. We want to place people on, to speak. We want to do things like that. We want to make sure it's an experience that stays on even beyond the show dates themselves. So, you know, for that thousand dollar investment of someone in Eureka Park, they get in the directory, they get access to the press room, they get everything possible. But of course, a Samsung or a uh, Intel or a Qualcomm is going to have a, in a sense, a bigger presence and more notice with, you know, hundreds of people and lots of investment. But this this is a show for startups and we want to keep it that way. You're based in, in Washington, D.C. and you must spend a lot of time talking to lawmakers and and other groups in the Beltway. You know, just in terms of big issues, I think probably on your plate in this past year, net neutrality seems quite large. Where do we stand there? Well, we have the entire FCC leadership coming, including the chairman. I'll I'll be interviewing uh, Chairman Tom Wheeler and raising that issue of net neutrality. That is a very, very big issue. It's a more complex issue with a lot more agreement than the people on on different sides than, than you would be most people seem to understand. I mean, hmm. it's great that, uh, you know, a comedian could write, do a funny video about it, but the, and I think everyone agrees you have to keep the net open and you have to make sure that any startup can have access to it. The question is, how do we get investment in infrastructure? How do we get competition in broadband? What do we have to do as a matter of national public policy so that every American has a choice of internet providers at high speed? And that's, I think, the question. It's Mm. not a question of whether any startup should have access to the web. Of course they should. It's a question of people having access or choice. There is more important information. You know, I would submit that someone's medical information, which could save their lives by getting that content to a doctor remotely, is more important than pornography. And I don't (laughs) think most people would disagree with that. So, and pornography does clog a lot of the bit streaming the internet now. Undoubtedly. So, you know, I, I, don't, I think we have to have a reasonable discussion. And, you know, I was a little disappointed that President Obama got involved in, in, in an unprecedented way for an independent federal agency where he basically appointed every commissioner with a mandate. It's a lot of it is just going with the flow of what the population wants. And sometimes you have to say, yes, everybody wants this, but let's dig deeper and figure out what we should get for the future of our kids, for the future of the country, and would make the most sense. And yeah. I really believe the answer is competition in broadband. And once we have competition in broadband, a lot of the problems go away. Well, that would be nice. And, and we don't have very much of that right now. But what should we do to encourage it? And there are mm. other big mm-hmm. issues out, out there as well. If you know, Free trade is a big issue. The Information technology agreement talks just collapsed in Geneva. They would have set the tariffs down to zero for a whole range of products. And the Asians got into a little bit of the battle with each other. And, and, you know, we got hurt because we couldn't have this multilateral deal. There's issues involving patent trolls, which is not helpful for startups and big companies and middle-sized companies. That's an issue which I think Congress will be attacking early in 2015. That's an important issue. There's highly skilled immigration where... You know, if we've gotten the president of the United States and the political parties to totally agree on the solution, the challenge is that President Obama and the Democrats have tied it into the overall immigration reform. And that's, as Steve Jobs told President Obama five years ago, you're going to kill it that way. And so far, Steve Jobs, sadly, has been right, you know, several Mm. years after he died. You know, we think maybe that'll break apart in 2015 and President Obama will be presented with legislation just on highly skilled and entrepreneurial immigration. And there's lots of other issues filtering through Washington, like privacy, uh, internet security, cybersecurity, things like that. Well, it sounds like you don't lack for things to do, Gary. You've got a lot on your plate, and especially now with CES coming up. I have a question for you, just you know, as we wrap up here. I want to know, so looking forward a couple of weeks to uh, January 12th, the show floor is closed, all the semis are loading up the exhibits and CES and all the, all the people are leaving town. 
where do you go, Gary? What, what what do you do after your duties at CES have wrapped up? Well, I had this wonderful invitation to go to Hawaii and experience the Sony op- Open, but my wife and I decided we wanted to see our kids, so I go back home. Um, <laughs> a family man. Good for you. A family man. So, you know, uh, people are more important than products. There you go. Well, Gary, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on Venture Beats Technology Podcast, What to Think. I wish you well and hope the show goes great for you. We'll catch up with you afterwards. Thanks, Dean and Dylan. Happy New Year. See you in Vegas. Thanks. You too. And that's a wrap for What to Think, Venture Beats Technology News Podcast. Once again, thank you for joining us. If you're going to be in Las Vegas, look for Dean or other members of the Venture Beat team there. We'll look forward to chatting with you. And as always, you can find us online at VentureBeat.com where we publish dozens of tech news stories every day. If you haven't subscribed to this podcast in iTunes yet, please do. Just search for What to Think. Until next week, I'm Dylan Tweeney with Dean Takahashi from VentureBeat. We'll catch you later. 